uncertainty. I want to let you know that we are recording this session. However, there will be 10 minutes at the end of the session where we will not be recording. So if there are any questions that you may have that are of a confidential nature, you can feel free to ask them then. We will remind you about this later in the program as well. The C2P2 family leadership, uh, there are four major project activities. They include this webinar. Um, this is the first of a series of webinars. Um, so we have online leadership development training, guidance and technical assistance from trained parent consultants, and then we will be having an annual opportunity for networking with other families to help achieve true inclusion for children. And in addition to this, we will have online resources available to those who are interested in this project. So as I said, the first webinar is tonight. We're very pleased that we have uh, Tim Bristol with us, uh, who will be conducting Creating a Vision for Your Child's Future this evening. Future webinars, which will be starting next year, probably at the beginning of the school year. We don't have the dates confirmed yet, but look for us. And since you're on our webinar, you'll be on our um, mailing list, and we'll be sending you notices. Some of the ideas that we've come up with are inclusion for basics, uh, another session on parent professional relationships, working collaboratively with uh, your administrators and educators at your school. Um, another topic will be how to connect with community resources. Um, parents have told us that making smooth transitions are, is also a very important topic that we'd like to uh, bring you some state of the art uh, best practice information, as well as information on social security disability benefits and Medicaid. So those are just a few of the topics that we intend to have uh, next year. Um, in terms of the guidance and technical assistance from trained parent consultants, we're very pleased here at the Institute to be collaborating with Pennsylvania's Education for All Coalition, which is known as PEAK. Uh, parent consultants will be matched with families participating in C2P2 uh, family leaders uh, training uh, training. Uh, those folks who need guidance and technical assistance will be doing a match and um, you can, you know, really have some one-on-one -on -one great information from those parent consultants who are very well versed in inclusive practices. Our intention is that in May 2014, a face-to-face -face networking event will be held for eligible C2P2 FL families. Um, we know from our 20 years of experience in doing face-to-face -face training for families in leadership development that one of the most important components of doing, of, of having family leadership uh, training is really to have some good face-to-face -face time with other families um, and give you the opportunity to meet one another, to form some alliances, and to develop and learn from each other. Uh, people have told us over the years, and we just know this to be true, and I think this will be a really important uh, piece of this particular project. Um, the other in, um, really in, incredible and um, robust piece that we're going to have for you is that all of these webinars are recorded, as I had mentioned, and they will be on our website at the Institute for um, Disabilities, as well as we are developing other online resources. The, you can see on your screen there are these two resources. One is a Ning group, and it's a uh, again a platform for people to for us to share some of the best practices information and resources with individuals, as well as to have some uh, people can log on to this and join the Ning. Um, platform and be able to have a discussion uh, virtually with one another about this. We also have a closed Facebook, um, which you'll see this reference, and this, uh, you know, you can, this will be posted for you after the, the webinar. Um, so again, the goal of this project is to create a network of family leaders who will work together with educators and administrators to champion inclusive practices for children with disabilities in the non-traditional school community. Uh, this is my contact information. If people have any questions after the session, please feel free to contact me, and I will put you in touch with the uh, 
right person to speak with. Um, and I would like to remind you right now, uh, we are required uh, by our funders, and we certainly do want your <coughs> feedback to make this experience as um, good an experience as can possibly be for you. And so we have this, uh, we've developed a survey, monkey survey. It will take you no longer than five, 10 minutes to complete it. But if you could please fill out the survey and give us feedback on how we can improve the session. Uh, you may have some great ideas for other topics that we can cover in the next year or so. That would be very helpful for us. Um, some of the other things, uh, I'm repeating myself, but the session is recorded. It's important for people to know that. We have decided, um, as I said, for confidentiality uh, reasons, if people are uncomfortable with not having some information or questions being asked, um, that you can do so at the at 8:20, right before the 10 minutes before we close the session. Um, if you would like to ask a question during this session, you'll see on the right hand of your screen that there's a little hand icon. So if you just hit the hand icon. Um, it will appear, we will get a message on this side of the, the, our um, computer that you want to ask a question. And um, Tim Grussell, who is our speaker this evening, will be able to, will acknowledge you and you'll ask your question. Um, and so without any further ado, I'm really very pleased to have someone who has worked with us here at the Institute on Disabilities for many years doing our family leadership. In fact, I think he was there from the very beginning. So. Uh, for, for the past 20 years, Tim has been um, really working with many of our families and individuals with disabilities talking about this particular subject, and we're very pleased to bring him to you um, to talk about creating a vision for your child's future. And Tim is the Director of Quality, the Quality Enhancement Support Team here in Pennsylvania, so I'm going to let Tim take over now. Thank you so much. Uh, before we get started with Tim, does anyone have any questions? Click your little hand icon or forever hold your hand. <laughs> okay. All right. We're going to go to Tim. Good evening. Hi, I'm Tim Brussel. Um, it's an honor to be here, as it always is. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, I've been doing this. I'm one of the original presenters from uh, C2. And uh, doing this for about 20 years. Um, so I hope everybody's having a good evening so far, and we'll. Uh, if anybody has any questions as we go along, please uh, feel free to um, send them our way. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I've been in the field of developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities for 40 years uh, this year. And I've done, have a very eclectic career. I've done just about everything that there is to do in this field, including Supports coordination, running residential programs, day programs, uh, working for government, working in the consulting side of things, and working at the Institute on Disabilities. Um, I want you to know right up front um, that I don't have a whole lot of experience with kids, and um, that there's a reason for that as in terms of why I'm actually presenting this evening because it ties into the, the subject matter, which is creating a vision for your child's future. Kids become teenagers. Teenagers become young adults. Young adults become adults. Adults have their uh, continuum of life and become older adults. And the whole process of moving from one life stage to another is about moving forward and creating a vision for the time period that you're in. So it's, it's very important for, uh, for families to understand, begin to understand the visioning process very early on. What does envisioning the future mean? 
on a day-to-day -day basis, families are consumed with getting the meals on the table, the kids to the soccer games, the uh, transporting to choir practice, uh, church activities, playground activities, swimming teams, uh, and when we're con when we're when we're sort of wrapped up in our day-to-day -day existence, we sometimes lose sight of the future until it's sort of upon us. Um, from a historical point of view, we want to begin to focus on our hopes, our dreams, and our personal aspirations for our kids. That sounds like a pretty simple concept uh, when we're dealing with uh, the systems that support children, the education systems, the therapy systems, the early intervention systems. But focusing on our hopes, dreams, personal aspirations is something that's relatively new. It's not something that was available to families uh, from, uh, except in perhaps maybe the last 40 years or so. Because focusing on, 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 on our kids' hopes and dreams and aspirations was something that was typically left to the professionals. Uh, it was left to the teachers. It was left to the therapists. It was left to the doctors. It was left to the people who uh, controlled how uh, supports and services were, were, were delivered to kids. And it really didn't have very much to do with families at all. And, but that's changed. That's changed with the uh, advent and the uh, sort of continuum of what's called the person-centered model of support where we now, we, where, 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 where the old days of having people from the outside run life for kids uh, it's about kids and their families and their friends and their supports and their grandparents and their aunts and their uncles who are helping to establish the dreams and personal aspirations and to define those. Um, the role of parents are, is as the guardian, the standard bearer, the nurturer of your child's future. Um, I have a daughter in the beginning. When she was a little girl, she was a wholly owned subsidiary of the Tim Bruce Hall Corporation. She was mine. I owned her. And I was in charge of defining what her future was going to look like. But as time went on, the role of parents is to transfer the ownership of the future to their child. When my daughter was born, I had hopes, dreams, aspirations for her. I acted on those things to, to a point at which point she began to take those things over. I remember specifically the first time it really happened where she had her own dreams and aspirations and uh, her own vision of the future that was uh, inconsistent with mine. And that's when she was five years old. And she, I remember like it was yesterday, where my vision, my hopes and dreams for her was that uh, she would have some uh, exposure and some, some, some sense of spirituality. So we went to church together. And um, I thought that was a very important part of her future. She did not uh, when she was five years old. And I remember like it was yesterday walking up to the church where we were attending and my daughter pulling back on my hand and saying, I'm not going in. And it's like, what do you mean you're not going in? Yeah, you're going in. Uh, you're going in and you're going in now. Uh, the organ music is starting to play. And um, she decided at that point that um, she was wearing the ugliest dress that had ever been uh, put on a little girl. And that if she walked into the church, that people would fall out of the pews and would start rolling around in the aisles, uh, laughing hysterically. Uh, so it was her, it was the first time she ever began the process of, of defining what her own future was going to be. Uh, and from there on, it, 
it, it sort of went downhill. No, it didn't. But uh, at, at the age of, and she's now 31 years old, and uh, at this point, although I still have private hopes and dreams and aspirations, the whole role of parenting was about turning those over in a logical, sane, uh, safe way for her to become an adult. And that's the role of parents have in transferring that ownership of the future to the child. But in the beginning, uh, as parents, we own it. Uh, why do we talk about a vision and, and, and the importance of it in the first place? Well, it's because uh, for many of you, you will become involved in um, planning for different supports and services that your child may need to support him or her as they move through their childhood and into their uh, adolescence and into their teenage years and even their adult years. And the planning, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's one of sort of the facts of life. It's one of the realities and um, it, it, it's sort of the piece that is, it presents a lot of difficulties for families at times and but we need to do it. Uh, there's a lot of reasons, mostly, uh, for uh, monetary reasons, but it, 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 it establishes a blueprint for supports and services that are the foundation for growth and development. There's some examples of planning that, that families will likely uh, run into uh, over time. Uh, the individual education plan. Um, Individual education plan, just as sort of an aside, uh, if you're not familiar with this, is something that actually originated in Pennsylvania as a response to the 1971 uh, rights education uh, litigation that allowed kids um, to have a free and appropriate education in our public school system. Um, that laid the foundation for what happened later in 1975, which is the Individuals uh, with Disabilities Education Act, which broadened the rights of kids to uh, education throughout the whole country. Um, the IEP is the planning document that is used uh, in the school system, in the education system. Another example of planning is the individual service, uh, I'm sorry, the individual supports plan, uh, which is the planning process for uh, typically for adults uh, who use supports and services. And the IFSP, the individual family services plan, uh, which uh, goes from birth to three years old. One of the most overlooked parts of the whole planning process is the vision piece of that. In none of these, and I'm going to go back for just a second, in none of these uh, examples of planning, the IEP, the ISP, the IFSP, is there a requirement that there be any kind of broad vision statement? And we'll talk a lot, we'll talk about what that means, but none of them have that as a component of planning. All of them have goals and objectives and, and, and outcome statements and measurement and how we know things are getting done, but none of them actually requires that there be a big picture that, that, that says, here's where my son or daughter is going. In the future, and lays out that 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 sort of roadmap for for your son or daughter to get where they're going. It's a critical but very overlooked aspect of planning, and it's one that because it's not uh, a requirement of planning, it's sort of left to the um, the whims of who might be working with the planning process or controlling the planning process. And that's why I'm here to talk to you tonight as parents, because it's so incredibly important to lay that framework and that a well-formulated and articulated vision serves as the foundation for all aspects of planning. 
that anything that comes afterwards should relate to the big picture. The vision statement is a keystone of planning. Uh, all aspects of planning are built upon the foundation of a long-term vision, the goal, the objectives. Uh, the goals, which are the short-term steps to achieving the vision, the, objection, the objectives are the steps to attain goals, and how we implement the way to get from point A to point B is uh, the implementation strategies. And most plans have those three pieces, but very few have well-articulated vision statements. Yogi Berra, uh, the great baseball player, uh, manager, perhaps said it best. If you don't know where you're going, don't be surprised if you end up somewhere else. Um, and that's very true because if we don't know exactly what the future holds for our kids, sometimes we get to a place that we just really don't want to be. And then we look back and we say, how did that happen? And we, 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 we realized that it's because we probably didn't define where we were going in the first place. So we, we want to begin to think about our kids in terms of where they're going to be at some point in time in the future. What a vision statement does. A well-constructed vision statement which becomes a part of any kind of plan, allows for um, there to be consensus. What do I mean by that? It means that when you walk into a room that's filled with teachers and administrators and physical therapists and occupational therapists and recreational therapists and music therapists, that everybody is going to sort of have their own sense of where your son or daughter should be heading. That may or may not be consistent with where you want them to be headed as a, as a parent or where your child wants to be headed in conjunction with how, with, 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 with your relationship with your, your child. And a well-constructed vision statement allows for there to be the beginning of consensus in that, that where, where people wrap themselves around, uh, uh, the, the, the notion of where you're headed going forward. It also helps to define the parameters of what's negotiable to you as a mom and dad and what's non-negotiable to you as a mom and dad in terms of where your child is headed. Um, an example. Um, a mom or dad, parents might have a vision where they would like their child at some point in time to use full sentences uh, to communicate language in, with, with language. Uh, this that that might be non-negotiable as, as as something where you see your your your, your kids headed, and that brings that 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 sends a very clear message to the speech therapist. Uh, that um, that that's non-negotiable to you as a family in terms of where your son or daughter is headed. So that we need to begin to think about uh, uh, those things that are that that that, that just are, are are critical for your child and where and where, where you see them going in the future. All right. A well-defined vision statement. It provides the criteria for judging the sanity, rationality, and functionality of all of the planning elements. I've been doing this for a very long time. I work with plans all the time. I'm going to get to some one that I actually worked with today as an example in a little bit. Uh, and I can tell you from professional and personal experience that the planning processes that are in place to support people are all oftentimes not very sane, they're not very rational, and they're not very functional. In other words, they are oftentimes not worth the paper that they're actually printed on. And that a tightly defined vision statement 
a, 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 a crafting of where you see your, 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 your son or daughter headed in the future allows you to begin to judge the sanity, the rationality, and functionality of, of, of all other planning elements. Uh, for instance, let's, I've seen plans that will have things that don't have anything to do with anything. Uh, a goal for uh, a, a, a kid to tie the shoe. And that's something that somebody else imposed on a child without really thinking it through in terms of what that means to the child, to his or her family. That may not be important at all. It may not, it may not have, be functional at all. It may not be rational at all. It may not be necessary at all. And it might uh, end up being one of those things that really frustrates a child. And but it ends up in a plan because it's it, 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 it because the division piece of it isn't really firmed up, and so people begin to introduce things that just don't really make sense. A, a well-crafted vision sense, a vision statement allows you to begin to test the the, the, the sanity of 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 what the rest of, what's in the rest of the plan. And a vision statement is an evaluation tool for you as a family to determine if your child is moving in the desired direction. In other words, uh, if you have a sense of where you're going and it's actually written down and it's actually out there for people to understand and to, to, to uh, form the basis of planning, you can figure out whether or not your child's moving in the direction that you want him or her to be going in. So we need to have this as a part of planning and again, this is not something that's typically a, a required part of planning, and it's really left to the uh, 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 family to 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 do and 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 to bring to the table. Oops, I think I went too far. Hang on a second. In the absence of a well-defined vision statement, which I think I touched on a little bit. We end up, we run the risk of ending up with things that don't make sense. We have goals that end up not making sense. Uh, I see bad goals all the time. Uh, I brought a couple along with me. They're not as part of the, they're not part of the actual PowerPoint presentation. Uh, but here's one where uh, it was in a, a little boy's plan. It said H, it's not his full name obviously, H will cross the street safely three out of six trials, which I don't know exactly, but it means that maybe that he can be hit by a bus three out of those six times, I don't know. But it, 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 it or that uh, L will wear only one article of clothing daily, seven days a week. Or when handed a soaked washcloth and given unlimited verbal cues, J will bathe all parts of his body except his left arm, left hand, and back. Four out of seven times. I, I mean, what does that mean? It, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't have anything to do with anything. And but these are the kind of goals that show up in plans, in the absence of a well-articulated vision statement that says this is where my son or daughter is going. And it, in the absence of a well-crafted vision statement, uh, we we sometimes end up with services that don't contribute to desired outcomes. In other words, we end up with, 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 with therapy services or education services that really don't contribute to where your son or daughter is headed, and then we have wasted resources and effort. Uh, and in a time of limited effort, resources and effort, we want to make sure that, that the resources and effort that we have access to are used as appropriately as we possibly can to support where we're headed. Okay. I want you to think about your own individual day. Uh, if we were live and we were interacting here, I probably would have picked on one of you uh, to walk me through your day. I'll do it for you. Um, what did I do this morning? When I woke up this morning, the first thing I did was I got out of bed, I put my feet on the floor, I threw my bathrobe on, I walked downstairs, uh, 
I have two little screaming terriers that were uh, begging for breakfast and make outrageous noises at me until I feed them. I feed them, I take them out to do their business, to bring them back in. Then I go over to my copy machine. I have a cup of coffee, I actually have two. After I pick up the newspaper uh, with uh, one of my terriers who brings it down the driveway for me. So anyway, uh, I did that and then I had a cup of coffee and I had some yogurt. I took a shower, I shaved, I brushed my teeth. I ironed the shirt that you see me wearing. Uh, I don't wrinkles at this time of day, but uh, I did that. And then, let's see, what else did I do after that? Uh, after I got dressed, I went down to my office and did some emails, returned some calls. Um, and then I would made some notes for this presentation for this evening. After that, uh, did a couple more phone calls, got my car, drove to Philadelphia from Reading, and uh, did some field work for another project that I work on regularly, and did some evaluation work in the field today. After I was done with that, um, let's see, what did I do? After I was done with that, oh, yeah. Uh, made some more calls from my car, got in my car, drove down to Temple here, um, and here I am, and I'm making this presentation this evening with uh, you all, and and uh, spend some time with some of my colleagues uh, here at the Institute on Disabilities. And when I get home this evening, which is probably about an hour and a half drive, I'll probably hang out a little bit, um, watch a little TV, and then I'll go to bed. And that was my day. Now, when you think of that, uh, I spent time living, which was the stuff related to, you know, sort of just getting ready, organizing my life, getting it, uh, you know, my shirt done, my body clean, my face shaved, the kind of stuff that you do to take care of yourself to live on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I learned. Uh, this whole experience with the webinar is a learning experience for me today because I've never done it before. Uh, for 20 years, I've done this presentation live, and it's really, really strange to just be talking to a camera rather than to actual people who I can talk to and look at and share and laugh with and pick your brain and you pick mine and uh, that whole kind of thing. So this is really strange and it's weird, but I'm learning something. Uh, I'm doing a stretch here, and uh, that's it's cool because I'm learning. So I'm spending some time today learning. I've been living. I've been learning. Uh, I've been working uh, because I was working on some of the other projects that I was doing today. Uh, I spent time having and building relationships, working on some old ones, uh, making some new ones with some of the folks here that I've never worked with before. And number five, I probably won't get to do a whole lot of today. I'll do that tomorrow when you know I just have an office day in my office and I'll get to go to the gym after work and that kind of thing. I probably won't do a whole lot of free time. But when you really think about it, when you break down your day, when you break down life, it really is only those five things. It's very depressing, isn't it? Uh, it it's really only five things. It's living, learning, working, having and building relationships and playing and how we spend our free time. That's it, folks. That's it. That's 24 hours. That is it. So when we're beginning the process of thinking about where we're going in the future, I'd like you to think about how you see your child in terms of where, how, and with, I think that should be with whom. Is that right? That should be with whom. I screwed that up. Uh, it should, and with whom he or she will live, learn, work, have and build relationships, play and spend, spend free time. Those are the five elements of a day of life. And when we strip it all down, that's what it is. So if we can identify, if we can begin the process of identifying where your son or daughter is headed in terms of where, how, and with whom he or she will live, learn, work, play, and build relationships. Uh, we've got the, the, the fundamentals of a vision statement. I like before, I, I always recommend this, before, uh, before you 
engage in the process of, of creating a vision statement for your son or daughter, for your children, I really encourage you to go through the exercise of doing it yourself. Uh, it's very powerful because, again, when we're, when we're caught up in the day-to-day stuff that, you know, just, you know, of living, we sometimes need to step back and take a look at where our own lives are. And if we were doing this as a live uh, exercise, I would actually ask you to be doing this right now. Uh, this exercise has actually evoked uh, laughter, it's evoked tears, it's evoked uh, frustration, it's evoked anger, it's evoked uh, all kinds of emotional responses from people who have just just given the time to sit and do this. Uh, it, it, it is a reflective exercise that, that, that allows you to look at your life, where it was, where it is today, and where it is in the future. I would encourage you to do this. This is, there is a download for this on the Institute's uh, website where there's a chart. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than this that you can go and fill this out. I, I, I picked five years ago. Uh, five years in an adult's life is a pretty reasonable time to look backwards. It's a pretty reasonable time to look forward. But I, take, take a look at where your life was five years ago in terms of where, we, where, were you, where, where were you living? What were you learning? Where were you working? What kind of relationships did you have? Uh, what were you doing with your free time? What's it look like today? And if you can do those two things, it gives you the comparison that's, that's sometimes necessary to look ahead. Where do you want to be living? Where do, what do you want to be learning? Where do you want to be working? Who do you want to be hanging out with? What do you want to be doing with your free time? Um, and if you can go through this exercise for your health, you, yourself, I think it will help to clarify how you do it for your son or daughter. It will make it a little bit easier to begin the process of creating that vision statement for him or her. Again, the chart is is is, is on the on the website that you can download after the, this is over this evening. Um, obviously, when we're working, when we're when we're trying to create a vision for our child and look into the future in terms of where, how, and with whom your child will live, learn, work, play, have relationships. There, we, we, we don't do it in terms of five minute increments. Um, we can't because age is a factor. Uh, babies evolve very quickly. A one-year-old, uh, two months in a, in a one-year-old's life is, 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 is it is like almost like 20 years in an adult's life in terms of what they learn, where they're going, what they're doing, they're walking, they're talking, they're 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 moving around, they're they're fidgeting, they're learning about their hands, their feet, they're all all the, it, it, it's an amazing time in the child's life. So you can't really use a five-year time frame necessarily if you don't want to. Factors that influence the vision statement are are our child's age, um, our child's health uh, situation. Uh, a child might have uh, a health influence or a health concern that might uh, might influence how far we see into the future, how we see into the future. Um, learning. For some kids, some kids learn very quickly. Some kids don't learn very quickly. Some kids are slower to pick up things than others, so that the learning piece of it has a lot to do with the time frame and the motivation. Um, Motivation in terms of creative, create, creating a vision statement has a lot to do with, with how far we can look into the future as well. Um, right now, um, I'm getting a whole lot more motivated to think about retirement than I was when I was 30 or 35 years old. Uh, when I was 30 or 35, I was thinking about defining my work career and and, 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 and working to do the best that I could so that I could move forward. Now I'm thinking I'm sort of on the back side of it, and so the motivation becomes different for how you see the future. The same thing with your child and, and, and their, their, their place in the family. Once we create a vision statement, once we've got this thing, once we've looked into the future, into our crystal ball, and we said, hey, 
my son or daughter wants to live, learn, work, play with this person in this way, at this place, and, and, and in this manner, what do we do with it? Well, there's a lot of things we can do with it, and a lot of things we should do with it. First and foremost, I think you might want to think about packaging. Uh, in C2P2, over the 20 years that I've been working with that, I've seen some of the most creative packaging that you could imagine in terms of once the vision has been created, uh, we want to capture it. We can't keep it in our head. It's not going to do anybody any good, especially your child, if it's in your head. It's got to come out of your head. It's got to be packaged in some way. Uh, Excuse me, that was my Marco Rubio imitation. Uh, well, there's all kinds of ways to package it. Uh, you could create a book. I've seen parents create books. I've seen parents take a vision statement. I've seen it and take it to staples and, and, and laminate it between plastic and so that it becomes sort of like a wall poster. I've seen people actually put it on little business cards. There's little business cards that you hand out. You, you, it's, it's got a parade. It's got their, their, their kid's picture on the front of it and the vision statement uh, in the back, on the back of it. I've seen people do it by video, uh, by CD, by uh, uh, di different uh, uh, video presentations. The most important thing, though, like I said, is we, once the vision is created, once we've thought through where, how, and with whom our child's going to live, learn, work, play, and spend time with others in the future, we've got to share it with others. We can't keep it in our heads. We've got to be willing to get it out there and present it to the people who are going to be supporting your, 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 your child going forward. That could be the IEP team. That could be therapists, that could be teachers, it could be administrators, it could be uh, 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 all kinds of, of different support professionals, but it's got to be presented so that they can know it. They, they can't guess it. They're not going to know it. Uh, they don't read mine. And if you don't have it, then you run into and, and you, you, you're, you run the risk of it, of it not becoming a part of the planning process. Uh, and when I say in, in making it a part of the planning process, we want to make sure that we ask that it be included in the actual planning document itself. Uh, if anybody ever tells you that you can't put a vision statement into an IEP, uh, that's not true. Uh, you can put anything in the plan that you want, uh, and including, you know, a video that can be attached to the IEP. Uh, it, 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 there's, no, there's no rules on that. So that you can ask for, and you should ask for, that the vision statement become a part of the IEP as an attachment, uh, and so that the rest of the IEP can be judged in terms of what how, how it makes sense. Okay. Um, I want to share with you some real world experiences with uh, parents who have created vision statements. Um, I just got a letter, actually, and I'm going to read you part of it. Uh, I, I just got this not too long ago from a parent who was in uh, one of the live C2P2 classes, and she wrote me this letter. I said, Dear Mr. Grusel, I want to thank you for taking the time to present at our confidence and confidence partners in policy making for families, blah, 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 blah. Okay. I am certain that the vision statement will hold a lot of power in my child's future. Thank you for suggesting that we create them for our children. I've been working on it since this past Sunday. It's a work in progress, as I know that I'll revisit it as I learn more information. You, you instructed that we should address how, where, and with whom we envision our child living, learning, working, interacting, and playing in the vision statement. As I delved into this assignment, I realized that I want my son to fill in many of the blanks for himself. So I chose to word it accordingly. My vision won't fit on the, onto a business card, but that just shows how infinite my son's future will be. I decided to include a picture of my son, one showing his inquisitive nature in the vision, so that it will make an even greater impact on those who read it. I've enclosed a copy for you to read. The vision statement will be used to set the tone of any and all services my son will receive. 
As such, it will be used as a guide to establish the necessary goals and select the appropriate strategies, techniques to bring that vision to fruition. That is extremely powerful. However, the section of the presentation that had the greatest impact at this moment was the section about the downfall of labels. As soon as I arrived home on last Friday night, I wrote, wrote about my son's strengths and positive attributes. I don't know how else to express it, but to say I needed that. In some ways, I felt like I was drowning in a sea of medical diagnoses and uncertain prognosis. This task not only brought me to the water surface for a breath of air, but it also gave me the strength to leap out of the water and then plunge back in with a renewed spirit. I'm now swimming, and so is my son. Uh, that's the kind of thing that, uh, that I hope that each of you can get to, where you begin to see your, 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 your child in terms of their future. I know that each of you has dreams and hopes and aspirations for your children, and that, uh, that, that you want to share those with other people. If you do, it will make such a huge difference in the planning process and in, 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 in whether things work or don't work, whether they're sane or not sane, whether they're helpful or not helpful. Uh, and it's a parent, it's a huge responsibility. I understand that. Uh, but to bring it out into the open and give it light and give it sun and give it warmth and give it Water is like sort of growing a, a garden. I, I sort of like it planning sometimes to baking a cake. You can you can you can bake a cake and you can do it the right way. You can follow the recipe and you have this marvelous, delicious confection that's tasty and melts in your mouth. Or you can bake a cake like sometimes I do, which is lopsided and it it it, it it's a big huge mess. And it doesn't do what it was intended to do, which is to nourish and to be delicious, and it's not. And 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 so uh, planning is like that. When we include the vision piece of it, it is really the icing on the cake, and it's really the thing that really binds the rest of the the cake ingredients together. On your uh, on the presentation, we have a number of actual vision statements that people have written for their kids. Uh, I'd like to walk through uh, one of the, sh the, the shorter of the two, but I encourage each of you to read these to, um, to take a look at the vision statements. These are very specific to the folks that wrote them. It's, it's, it's just the, the families bringing to you know, to to others what they want for for their son or daughter. I want to share uh, Sophia Madison S with you. My name is Sophia, which is Greek for wisdom, but most people call me Sophie. My family also calls me sister. I would like to tell you about myself. This is my vision. I have a big brother named Alexander. He's in the first grade. I'm so excited to be going to kindergarten at the same school next year. I will ride the bus with my brother, just like all the kids in our neighborhood. I also have a little sister named Helena. I call her baby. She will be in kindergarten in two years. Music is really important to me. Incorporating songs into my lessons helps me to communicate with my peers, participate in class, and learn new things. I'm really good at using my iPad, which also helps me to learn and play. I'm a social butterfly as I enjoy being around my peers and I warm up quickly to new friends. I'm funny, kind, silly, sweet, stubborn, and I care about how others are feeling. I've received early intervention services since I was a baby, and these special people play an important role in my learning. I'm excited to have a new team next year when I become a kindergartner. I will be in a regular kindergarten class with my services pushed in. I learned best by being fully included in school, and I look forward to being included throughout my time as a student. School is amazing. I'm excited to participate in the social activities as well as the academic ones. I want to join Girl Scouts, play sports, and have play dates with my friends. I have lots to give to others, and it is important for me to know that I belong. I was diagnosed with Down syndrome prenatally, which brings with it some challenges, but my disability does not define me. I need help from my team to learn new skills, to participate in school and outside of school, so I can develop to my fullest potential. I did not need to be fixed, but accepted for who I am. My team will support me to have a full and rich school experience filled with dignity, respect, friendships, and learning to the best of my ability. 
As I grow up, I will have the same experiences as my peers. I will become a productive member of my community in which I live, know, am loved, value, and belong. If you look at this vision statement, it certainly meets the test of saying who Sophie is, Sophie, I'm sorry, who Sophia is, uh, what she's about, what she values, uh, what's important to her and to her family, but it also does a very nice job of defining who, how, and with whom she's going to live, learn, work, play, spend her free time, and build relationships. In terms of the content of it, what do we think about it? It doesn't matter what we think about it. It's hers. It belongs to her family. It is what her family wants for her, and uh, we're not here to judge it, and neither are other people there to judge what yours might be for your son or daughter. It Once it's presented, it is what it is, and uh, uh, that it, it needs to be honored and respected, put on a pedestal, and worshiped for, uh, for it, it, its individuality and and, and and a reflection of your family. So that's pretty much my summary, uh, my, my, my presentation for this evening. Uh, the vision statement is a critical, critical piece of planning. And I hope that each of you will take the time to do it for yourselves and then begin the process of doing it for, you, for, you, for your children, to bring that out and make it public, make it part of who you are and so that it becomes a, 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 an elemental part of planning and rules planning going forward. At this time, uh, I guess we'll entertain some questions. I do have a question here uh, that showed up on the screen. Will these vision statements be available to us? It gives a good blueprint to help do I am. Uh, yes, they will. They are available as part of the actual um, uh, PowerPoint presentation, which is downloadable from the okay. from the institute's website. Correct. Correct. Right. And we will be sending um, all of you that link to the website, and you'll be able to download those as well as uh, a copy of Tim's PowerPoint presentation, and um, as well as the um, the grid. Come on over. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, hi. Hello there. No, here we, oh, there. Here we are. Um, as well as the uh, table that was as part of the um, the PowerPoint, where you can um, actually do your own um, vision statement for your child. Mm -hmm. Correct. So those right. will all be available to you. Absolutely. Uh, and again, we encourage you to go and take those things off the website. Use them. They're tools. Yep. Um, are there other questions? Yeah, here. Sure. Let's let people talk. We can talk rather than read the questions. It's a small group. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I'll meet you as you okay. raise your hand. Okay. Hi, Allison. Hi. How does this translate uh, to my wanting to homeschool my child? Good question. How does this translate to homeschooling? IEPs are done. Yes. Yeah. I mean, IEPs are still done with right. homeschooling. Uh, so that uh, that it would actually translate very powerfully, in my opinion, to, to, to the homeschool situation, which is to put it out there, this is what we're going to do. This is, we want to homeschool. We want uh, your son or daughter to learn in this particular way, to spend time with kids and uh, their relationships in this particular way. So I am this particular way, and the, the homeschooling is the context, I suppose, for, for, for the goals, uh, for the vision statement, but it needs to be clarified and put out there for others to understand that this is what you want for your child and this is what works best for your family. Mm -hmm. Right. It's your blueprint, you know, and mm -hmm. to communicate with others and, and for your own family and for, I would imagine, for your own youth as your homeschool. Sort of think of it as a roadmap. 
Uh, where do you live? Where do you live, Allison? Uh, Cumberland County. Cumberland County. Okay, so you're in Cumberland County out there in the middle of the state, and um, you want to get to Philadelphia. Uh, in order to get to Philadelphia, you sort of have to have uh, a map, or you have to plug it into your GPS, or however you you just you just can't get in your car and start driving because you don't. I know you might end up in Nebraska, for God's sake. So you might want to, you've you got to plan your trip to Philadelphia. It's the same thing. Uh, the, 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 the defining where your, your, your child is going in terms of homeschooling or whatever kind of educational process is, is, is very important for other people to understand so that it becomes the foundation for all other planning. Okay. So does that mean that I would create the own goals and how we met those goals, or would I still have to meet with public school people to have a team? Actually, this is not my particular area of expertise in terms of IEPs with homeschooling. Uh, however, we will answer that question, and we will we'll get, we'll, we'll we'll get you that Absolutely. information. Uh, an IEP is required uh, for kids that are homeschooled, as well as kids that are homeschooled or public school uh, or in a parochial system or in a private system. So that the the but the specifics of homeschooling, I'm not that's not my area of expertise. But we'll find out. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Other questions for Tim? Let's see. I don't see any others. Well, all right. Any from, yes, and we do have some people in the room. Um, there's any in the room. Okay, if we have no other questions, what we're going to do is, right. wait, wait, we do have a question. Oh, Diane Perry. Okay. Hi. Hi, Diane Perry. How are you? You can talk to us if you'd like. We're going to unmute you, Diane. Can you hear me? Hi, Diane. Now we can. Hi, Tim. Hi, Kathy. Hi, How are Diane. You? I was just going to uh, mention to Allison that um, even though you have, no matter where your child's educated, the IEP team should always know um, where, where you want the future of your child. Where do you want them? Um, not only just because they're being homeschooled and that's where the academics are, but there's more to life than just the academics, too. So where are they going to maybe do some of those um, other social activities? Because I believe with homeschooling, there's also, you know, different places that you can meet up with other parents or other students for other engaging activities. So maybe that's part of the IEP, too, that you want to make sure that they're doing that. Excellent, excellent point. Can 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 she hear that? Could the yes. Can you hear us, Diane? Yeah. Allison, could, could Allison hear the response to that? Yeah. She could hear that directly. Okay. Uh, okay, great. Uh, yeah, I mean, Diane's totally correct. It it, it 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 goes to all the elements of of a vision statement, not just the education piece, uh, not just the recreation piece, the living, the learning, the working, the playing, the how, 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 how's a kid, how's a child going to build friends, uh, a relationship, a relation, a network of, of friends and, 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 and relationships. And the fact that you want your son or daughter to do that, uh, and then the goals wrap around that, uh, for a homeschooled child, that might be a bit different. But the vision that my son or daughter is going to have this network of friends that are going to play soccer or they're going to go swimming or whatever it is, is, is part of the vision statement and then the goals figure out how to, how to make that actually happen. Great. Wonderful information, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're well, welcome. Other folks know that Diane is the president of uh, PEEP. She is the Pennsylvania's Education for All Coalition. So, um, She's one of our great collaborators. And, uh, and Diane is also extremely experienced at doing vision statements, yes, she having is. done that yeah. uh, for her own children for many years. Yeah. 
Thanks, Diane. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody? Any other questions? Okay. We're going to stop recording now. At, um, and if people, oh, hold on a second. Oh. Here. Don't go away. There's Nira. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Uh, okay. Hi, I'm Nira. Um, Technology is wonderful. Is, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, we can. can. My question is about um, transitioning to a parochial school. My mm -hmm. son's in public school. He's in second grade now. Um, he went to a Jewish day school for um, pre-kindergarten. And it was a very good experience. They have a special ed support, but they don't have OT and speech or social skills. So I put him in public school. It's been very good in a lot of ways, but it's not what we want for him. And he really wants to go to this um, day school. My question is, how do you um, how do you work with them to get to understand good best practices for inclusion? Because they have a little bit of old-fashioned views, and they know they're not obligated by IEPs. Um, and I want to take the best standards of what I know in the public school world in terms of how we have the, um, you know, the, the rights for parents. I don't know. Do you have experience working with um, inclusion with parochial schools? Well, let me let me start there, and then we'll bring in some other. Right. We're going to bring in We're Kathy gonna... Rachia Meyer, who is our program associate, and who uh, can probably answer this question best. Is it Nira or is it Nira? It's Nira. Nira. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Nira, do you have, where, where, is it your son? Your son? Yeah, my son. He's okay. nine. He's in second grade. He's nine. And, yeah. What do you want him to be doing in the future? What do you want his life to look like? Do you have a sense of that? Do you have it written out? Do you have it planned out? Do you have, do you, is it well defined? Um, I have a vision statement, but it's not as nice as the way the ones you presented, so I like them as a blueprint. Um, okay. It was more like a list of his characteristics some of his interests. He went from losing all his language at 18 months, typical of autism, to being very successful with Lovat ABA and all kinds of interventions. And he speaks beautifully now. He's very social. He still needs all that kind of social skill support, but he loves being around people. Mm -hmm. And he's curious. Um, you know, he has certain interests like navigation, whatever. I, I want him to be able to do what he wants. He has in his mind he wants to be an architect. Oh, okay, perfect, perfect. Oh. All right. So he wants to be an architect. All right. People need to know that. People need to know that he wants to be an architect. Uh, I had a I had a mom one time, uh, who's 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 son, and she she showed up at my office one time. This is when I would live lived out in Lancaster County. She actually tracked me down at my office and she showed up in my office and she was crying her eyes out. She said, why are you crying? She said, because they they have my son in a in in a in a special ed class and I don't want him in a special ed class. I want him included and he wants to be an auto mechanic. And and I said, well have you told anybody that? Well no. Well you know what? You gotta tell people that that he wants to be an architect. She needed to tell people that she he wanted to be a, a car mechanic. Once he once 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 he once she once she told people that and made that a part of the vision, then supports and services could start to be built around it. Well, to make a long story short, he ended up in a Votech program, uh, which and he was in an auto mechanic program, and it wouldn't have necessarily happened if she would have let other people do things to him. Uh, mm -hmm. On his behalf, in, in, in thinking they were doing the right thing, that but, but where it was totally inconsistent with what he wanted and what 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 the family wanted. So you need to let people know that 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 he wants to be an architect, so that you can begin to plan things that might help him to be an architect. And you know what? Maybe he'll never be an architect. Maybe he'll be a doctor instead. Maybe he'll be uh, a train engineer instead. It, it, it's the support that he gets along the way that allows him to 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 be who he wants to be, and for you to be for him to be who you want him to be as as you. you Hi. Uh, I see two two points to your question. One is the regulatory issues, and you're obviously correct. And the school is aware that they do not have to follow IDEA. Individuals with Disability Education Act. However, they do have to follow ADA, so they do need to um, provide accommodations, reasonable accommodations. Mm -hmm. Additionally, 
There's also, if you were talking about some of your related services, occupational therapy, speech therapy, you, you and your school may or may not be aware of something called equitable participation. And they are actually required to go to the non-public schools, and this would be through your intermediate unit to what? provide services. I mean, it's something that if you're not aware of and you haven't yet you know, completed, you would make to have your school contact their intermediate unit and ask for equitable, for equitable participation to receive those services at your son's school. Secondly, um, I would, uh, what I heard you say was that you would like to see the school be more inclusive and you would like to um, have them think about the way they're practicing and, you know, improve their, um, um, let's just say that the way they're thinking about inclusive education to a more modern perspective. Um, my personal way that I would approach this is that looking at inclusion happens and it helps all the students in a classroom. So if they're finding ways to support your child, it will benefit the entire classroom. And this is one way that you can show support for the school and the other students as well as your child. Um, when they find a way to address your child's specific type of needs, you can pretty much guarantee there's at least a handful of other students who have the exact same type of needs that haven't been met as of yet. So it can help work with the entire classroom. I think a lot of times some schools may just have a fear of what to expect from children that are different, but it is in a way the parents' um, responsibility to educate them on this is my child's vision, um, and we want him to be included and share in all the activities of the other children. And let me show you some ways that you can do that to support him, as well as to support all the students that will help your teachers support everyone in a way that helps everyone. And going back to basics, if he wants to be an architect, you've got to let people know that he wants to be an architect. If he wants to play soccer, you've got to let people know that he wants to play soccer. If he wants to hang out with this person, that person, and you've got to let people know. It's, it, we can't expect uh, educators, therapists to know what the future holds in terms of, of, of where you want him to be heading and where he wants to be heading himself, because he's getting to the point where it sounds like he's getting ready to make some of his own decisions if he's not already, and that's got to be, that's got to be a part of the whole thing. It, it, it's where you've got to start. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a couple responses to that. He ha he himself has let people know. So his OT knows how much he loves to draw houses, and he had difficulty with drawing, so she taught him through using shapes. So like the, the I think individually teachers and therapists have been working with him. Um, I sort of have two issues. One is the public school right now, that even though he's become so much more high functioning, I just had a reevaluation done. I just got the report a week ago. And they dropped his IQ by 30 points. So, okay. like, I have a whole issue that here he talks about being an architect. He speaks beautifully. He has learning issues, and I'm trying to get them to help me find out working memory, information processing. And instead, they did an IQ test, and they dropped his IQ to the 50s. And I'm just like, this is insane. So I have, like, one side of me feels that I have to work on this public school to get an IE and get them more in line because they're going to change his whole track. He's in a mainstream class with pull out autistic support, and now I'm afraid that if I kept him in public school, they're going to put him in a more restrictive environment and change his whole track approach to life. So that's like the one place. I'm just bringing this up because if you can help me figure out how to approach both, I'd appreciate it. So he's made them aware. I've made them aware. It's not written in his IEP, that vision for the architecture, so I'll work on that. But they know who he is. They know he's vocal. And yet, now they came up, the psychologist did all her testing, and all of a sudden, he's a different kid than what he's presented in person. And I don't know how to deal with that with them. And then with the day school, um, he really wants to have a Jewish life, and, and they know that. I actually spoke at an inclusion conference last week, so, but, but they don't get the, um, like when you were saying ways that will accommodate all the children. So I asked them, and they said, well, we don't have an instructional aid. He, isn't, he has an aid at the public school that's instructional and behavioral. When I talked about wraparound, wraparound can only provide, you know, TSS and behavioral. So I don't know what to do with that piece, but he still needs instructional support. And then he could participate in a mainstream and not 
I don't want him in the self-contained special ed class. So do you follow my two sides that I'm like dealing with in any comment? I feel your frustration and I do suggest you do consider the IEE. That is a large change in the IQ. You might wish to, I mean, maybe in the way the testing may be conducted, it may have not been a nonverbal test where a nonverbal test might have been more appropriate. I would definitely have that conversation. I will say that, again, regulatory, um, the IQ level, the label of the child is not supposed to predetermine the type of program your child is, is recommended for, and the placement is a recommendation that you as a parent must agree to. Mm -hmm. So I, I do want to make sure that you're aware that you do have a voice when it comes to the school district portion, I will say. Um, again, with the private school, there it has to be more of a relationship building conversation that you have because they don't have the same requirements. Um, I, again, as you said about the one-on-one -on -one instructional aid with behavioral health, it would have to be done as to working more with on-task, off-task behaviors and something similar to that. Um, however, if you look at the way your goals are written for your behavioral health provider, there are ways to also support education as long as it's written in a very specific way, which I really am not able to give a lot of details at this point. I don't know how much to help. Okay. And can you comment on dual enrollment? You talked about equitable participation, but that I could have them dual enrolled and then have the services from the school district for the OT and speech? The school the intermediate unit typically would be the one to provide those services. And I, I cannot confirm whether it would be a dual enrollment or not, but the terminology is equitable participation, which allows the child to receive services for non-public non schools. Okay. And that would be for related services. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, we could just stop recording at this point. And uh, if anybody has any uh, sort of more confidential questions uh, that they'd like to talk about, we'll stop recording at this point. And uh, you can bring up some, you know, very specific things if you would like to do that.